Hey everyone, thanks for checking out this week's message. If you want to support our ministry, please visit hopecentertab.org and click on that Give Now button. We know that God has a word for you. Stay blessed. Today, uh, the theme that God put in my heart was fit to serve. And the key text that we're going to go to is Luke chapter 9. If you would go with me to Luke chapter 9, verse 62. If you have it, say amen. And these are the words of Jesus. Jesus replied, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. I'll repeat that. No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just come before you today giving you thanks for Lord, your precious word, I, we thank you so much that there's so many of us here, and at times where we present the word just in a general form, and yet you make it applicable to us personally. You have a rhema word from heaven directly to us. And so I just pray right now that you use that, your word in that way today, that if someone is here today needing to hear that special word from you, that they would hear it today. Lord, that you set, would set their spirit free to worship you, that you would take away all anxiety, all fear. Oh God, that you would just lift us up, Lord, and build us up in the most holy faith. Lord, as we hear your precious word, we ask for these things in the matchless name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And all God's children would say, amen. amen. You may be seated if you can. No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back. It's, it's really a fascinating statement that's being made here because it is the enemy's purpose in your life and in my life to take our eyes off of Jesus and to make us look back at things that perhaps had a stronghold in our lives, things that perhaps we used as our blankie, you know, that, that, that special sin or that, that situation. I mean, imagine now as you're going through this quarantine period, maybe some of you have been tempted to look at your phones, you know, and look at that number or, or think of that person that you know that God would not want you to deal with, but somehow you're, you're allowing yourself to fall back into these kinds of patterns. It's interesting what it says here, right? It says that you, it says, and looks back. You know, that's what the, again, that's what the enemy wants us to do. He wants to, he wants us to question our calling because once we're looking back, you can't look forward at the same time. And that is the tactic of the devil to change our focus to what was as opposed to what God has for us. You know, when you're driving your car, if you stare at something on the side of the road, you will begin to involuntarily drift towards that object. Whatever object you're looking to, and it's not a matter of your changing lanes. It's not that you're driving in that direction. I don't think any of us, you know, necessarily choose to at first, you know, turn our wheel, if you will, in the direction that we want to go. But what happens is, is that as we take our eyes off of Jesus and we, be look, we begin to look at whatever it is that attracts us, we begin to move in that direction. That's how backsliding starts. It's so, that's, that's how it is. My friends, it's a slow fade. Paul said something interesting about backsliding to his spiritual protege, Timothy. Um, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, four starting at verse 1, Paul says, The Spirit clearly says that in the latter times, some will abandon the faith. It's a very interesting use of, choice of words there. They would abandon the faith. And follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. You know, when, 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 you, when you read that, it's almost hard to conceive. How would a, 
You know, how would people turn to deceiving spirits and things taught by demons? Because they don't realize that they're deceiving spirits. They don't realize that what they're being fed are doctrines of demons. And it goes on to explain why we don't notice. Because such teachings come through hypocritical liars. Hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. They've been hardened. You know, they've allowed themselves to to walk in, in darkness. They've embraced things in their lives because they've refused to let go and let God And so they begin to teach this craziness. Verse 3 says, They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. We're talking about going back to religion, going back to practices that, that seek to have us, you know, accommodate ourselves to certain practices, you know, if you will, where we are emphasizing, you know, religion over our relationship with God. The interesting part of this particular passage is that he tells Timothy not only that that people will backslide, but he goes on to say how people will backslide in the end times. And he breaks it down in really in pretty deep in pretty big detail. He talks about the following those the teachings of deceiving or lying demons who apparently possess these hypocritical liars, as I talked mentioned before, that are operating with a hardened heart, with a hardened conscience. And again, the emphasis is about going to those, to those old ways. The point that the Apostle Paul is trying to make here is that people will not only abandon the faith from a relational perspective, that is to say replacing relationship with religion, But as a time that Jesus approaches, they will also fall away from scriptural truth. That is to say that they will deny basic spiritual truth. I don't know if you guys, you know, feel like I do, but people are buying lock, stock and barrel stuff that just doesn't make sense. I mean, who would ever think that something as simple and obvious as gender would be a problem? Where it, all of a sudden, you know, it's all of a sudden it's questionable, you know, and 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 the people, even in the church, how many know that people in the church are actually embracing this stuff? They're embracing this stuff, you know. The Word of God tells us that this is going to happen in the last day. The church of the last day uh, will compromise their basic foundational biblical principles principles and belief to such an extent that there will be no difference between what they believe and profess and what Satan would want us all to embrace. This is what the Apostle John says about the church of the last day that in the book of Revelation is represented as the church of Laodicea. In Revelation chapter 3, starting at verse 16, it says, So then, because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Now that, that doesn't sound too good to me. I will vomit you out of my mouth because, now listen, if you're, if you're being vomited out of, the house, out of the mouth of God, you may want to know exactly what is it in you that makes him sick, right? It says, because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing. Man, we're cooking with oil, man. We've got it together. We've got the people coming in. We're crowded. Everybody loves. Come to church and have some fun. And everything on the outside seems perfect. But you do not know. Now, there are really critical words. You do not know the Laodicean church is a deceived church. It's a church that believes one thing when in reality they are completely in a different place with God. You do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I remember when I was a teenager, it was the first time I really got into this, into the book of Revelation and I read this. And I, and, and I remember it hitting me, man. This is... The church of the last day is going to be wretched, 
man, like deeply evil, miserable, unsatisfied, poor, not really having, thinking they have, but not really having, poor, blind, and naked. What gets to me about this particular passage, and I think the key point that the Apostle Paul is trying to make, is that they will be so completely oblivious as to their morbid spiritual anemia that they will be in critical condition spiritually without even knowing it. They're going to be on spiritual life support and have no idea that they're there. The Greek term here that's used is the term epistemi, which means to draw away from, to abstain from. And what it speaks to is not necessarily to oppose the faith or come against it, because that's not the way the enemy rolls. And if the enemy came against you and some stuff is crazy, like what's happening in California, that's crazy. Straight up in your face. Don't, don't sing. Well... You know, like I said, you know, you know what they told Daniel? They told Daniel, don't pray. You know what I find interesting about the passage when it says, Daniel, don't pray? It says, and it, literally it says, okay, and, and the edict came out, don't pray. And so Daniel went up to his place, opened all the windows, and continued to pray. It actually says it right after. It says, okay, the rule is not to pray. Because if you pray, we will throw you in a lion's den. See, with Daniel, there was no choice in the matter. I'm a child of God, and I'm going to go to God three times, a, as was his custom. That's another thing. He didn't invent something to do at that point in time. It's not like, okay, we're going to get all religious now. You know, I never sang in church, but now I'm going to sing. That comes from a rebellious heart. You know what God wants you? He wants you to walk with him. And when you're walking with him, keep walking with him. Hold on to Jesus and don't let him go. And keep pressing in to his presence. Keep pressing into him. Saying, God, I believed in you from the beginning. I believe in you now and I will believe in you until the end. You know what? And before the rocks cry out, I'm going to praise you. Come on, somebody give God some praise. So what happens here is not, in, it's not that the world, and speaking about the church in terms of, the, of their condition, it's not that they're opposing outright because it would become obvious. This nefarious plan of people that are infiltrating the church would become obvious. But what, what, what would end up happening is that they become apathetic towards the faith. It's about, being, about rejecting gospel truth, the truth that's in his word. The prophet Isaiah warns us about this time where people will embrace, embrace evil and call it good. You know why? Because they want to justify themselves. I can't tell you how many people I know, even ministers that I know, that are doing things that really aren't, aren't in God's heart. They're not God's, God's will for their lives. But you know what? They, they, they bring it up and they say, you know what? I'm going to... I'm, I'm going to do this because I, I feel that I need to do it. And they end up being outside of the will of God. Because, of they, because they want to please themselves. Because they, they want to follow after something. That's what happened with most of us. We want to do something that we shouldn't be doing. And so rather than living with the, with, with the guilt and saying, you know what, I'm guilty and I, I shouldn't be doing this. We try to justify it. I find that crazy, man. You know, some people will do that with sin. We'll justify sin and say, you know what? It was God's will that I did that because, you see, when I did that, then God... That doesn't mean it was God's will for you to be a knucklehead. That doesn't mean it was God's will for you to fall on your face and sin against God. That is never God's will. The fact that God would use you anyway, the fact that God will look beyond our genius, if you will, Amen. And still use us is not about, you know, that it was God's will. It's about that we have a merciful God. Come on, somebody give him some praise. Because we have something called the blood of Jesus that watches us and cleanses us from all sin. And 
as a love that goes beyond our faults. It goes beyond us and loves us through it anyway. Hallelujah. The prophet Isaiah warns us, he says in Isaiah 5, 20, he says, woe to those who call good evil and, and evil good, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe, woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. I mentioned this before. I talked about Romans 1, and that was a little craziness at the end of the chapter. You know, it starts off with that statement. I mentioned that professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. It seems right to us. We need to be very careful and not look to satisfy ourselves with to satisfy God. Particularly in times like this that we're living in today, where people will use what, they, what appears to be logic to justify positions which are not God's will necessarily for your life. You know, as I say, everybody else is doing it, so we should be doing it. Remember when you told your mama that? When your mother said, you can't do this? And you're like, but everybody else is doing it. What did your mother tell you? Well, everybody else is not my kid. You're my kid. And you are not going to do it. We keep trying to do that. We do that with God. But God, everybody, God is that, you know what? I have a word for you. I have a rhema word for you. You may not like what I'm going to tell you. Amen? But I'm going to tell you it. I'm going to give it to you anyway. I'm going to jump around my preaching a little bit. You know, later on I talk about how, you know, we, we read, you know, that, that there is no sin but as such as is common to man. But with every, with every sin, right, God provides us a means of escape. And we take that to mean, how many of you have heard this? God will never give you something too heavy for you to bear. Have you heard that? Raise your hand if you heard that. It's a lie. Are you hearing me? I said it's a lie. Hallelujah. I can't tell how many times God has given me things to do. That. I'm like, are you crazy? I'm like, what? What? There's no way I could do that. Which is exactly why God gives it to you. Because what's impossible for you is possible for you, for him. Come on, somebody give God some praise. And he wants you to internalize the biblical truth. I can do all things through Christ, which gives me strength. It's not about my strength. It's not about my ability. It's about my availability. It's about my submission to God. It's about saying, God, I will be there. Lord, if you crush me, you crush me. But I will be there. I want everything you have for my life. But the enemy, in Spanish we say, se está luciendo. The enemy is going nuts. He's going crazy. Right? Not only influencing the world, but trying to influence the church. And that's the big problem. I don't consider the world the problem. I consider the church the problem. The world is crazy, has been crazy, and will continue to be crazy. But you would expect something different from the children of God. But the Bible tells us that, that the church, if you will, is going to be going, doing some funky things at the end of, before Jesus comes. They're going to do some crazy stuff, which is why the apostle Paul tells the believers in Thessalonica in, in uh, chapter 2, he says, don't let anyone deceive you. Don't let anyone deceive you because they're going to try. For that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. There is a rebellion. There is a turning away. There is an abandoning of the faith. There is a waxing cold of our hearts. Again, it's not about opposing God violently, but about, about, about becoming insensitive. It's interesting that these, these, lying, these hypocritical liars that teach these doctrines of demons, right, their, their hearts have become cauterized. They, they have become insensitive. That's how you get to that point. Do 
Jude warns us that we're going to have to fight. It's going to be a fight in the last days for us. Why? Because ungodly people will be invading the church. In the church of the last day, destruction is not going to come, come from the outside in. It's going to come from the inside out. This is the way the word of God puts it in Jude. Starting at verse 3. Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt I had to write and urge you to contend for the faith, to fight for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. I want you to listen to this carefully. Verse 4. For certain men, I think that's a universal men. It's not necessarily males. I think women can equally be used of the devil. Can I hear an amen? Not too many amens. That's all right. <laughs> we holy. Okay, whatever. <laughs> For certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago. Now check this out. Look at this word. Have secretly slipped in among you. Have secretly slipped in. Among you. That's pretty, that's pretty clear. They're going to secretly slip in. You're going to look at them and say, well, this is a man of God. This is a woman of God. Look at the way they carry themselves. Look at the talent, you know, whatever. They look, they look at, man, they, they are perfect. But what you don't understand is that they're demon-possessed. That they have long since abandoned God. God has become a fantasy in their lives. You know why God has become a fantasy in their lives? Because they've walked away from God. That's how people get to the point where they, they become atheists. And a lot of these movements, by the way, a lot of these atheist movements are led by people that claim to have once had a relationship with Jesus. They say, so how is that possible? How is it possible that somebody who was a minister, had a relationship with God, now is denying everything. You know why? Because they took their eyes off Jesus, put their eyes on whatever their favorite sin was, they began to move in that direction. As they move in that direction, they move away from God, and so God ceases to be a reality in their lives, and so they expand that to mean that he must not be real at all. Secretly slipping, slip, slipped in among you. These are godless men who changed the grace of God into a license for immorality. They abused the grace of God to allow all kinds of craziness to happen within the context of the church of Jesus Christ. You know what they say? You know what? God loves you. God loves you. Yeah, God loves you. How many believe God loves you? God still hates the sin. Can I hear an amen? God's statement, be holy for I am holy, has not changed. Okay? Now, not that we can make ourselves holy, but here's a good part. He makes us holy. He justifies us. He sanctifies us. He brings, him to him, brings us to himself. Oh, yeah, we may not be. We may not be that perfect person. You know, that we want to be and that we would like to be, but we sure are not what we were before. Can I hear an amen? amen. If, you're t if you're here today serving Jesus, you can join with me in saying, God has taken me a mighty long way. Hallelujah. God has taken me a mighty long way. These people are going to present themselves as godly, but they're not what they appear to be. And so we're going to have ministers and teachers within the church, highly gifted from a human perspective, which are going to be used as instruments of the enemy to destroy the church and what it stands for from within, turning away from the faith, this abandoning of the faith that we, that we read about in Timothy is about changing our focus away from Jesus and scriptural truth in order to follow ways of thinking that are pleasing to us, even though they're disgusting to God. And so, as I said, we breach, when we do that, we breach our relationship with God.
Very interesting about this whole thing about loving God and God loving us. Jesus himself has any personal relationship that a human being can have with him to first submitting ourselves to him. It was Jesus himself who said in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. Let me put it to you a different way. Talk is cheap. You can say you love me all you want. I think every single person here probably has been through some point in their life where, you know, they were, they, they, they heard the words, I love you. And the truth of the matter is, is that when push came to shove, that those words were not exactly true. I praise God for the love of God. That everlasting love of Jesus. Amen. I don't deserve it. Come on, somebody give God some praise. I don't deserve it. You don't deserve it, but he gives it to us, man. He gives us to us, gives it to us. But this church of the last day is going to be a compromised church that regards being accepted or being liked as more important than being holy. And it's all from top to bottom. It's all because they changed the, their focus from Jesus to themselves. You know, one of the, it's interesting when I, when I do um, counseling, couples counseling, one of the things that when, when things are really bad between two, two people, a, a married couple, a lot of times what you'll see is that one of them will say, well, what about me? I've got needs. I've got, you know, and, and really they're, they're focusing on what is important to them without understanding that they need to really focus on what's important to their spouse and their spouse needs to focus on what, you know, it goes in two directions and then together, then they bring together, it brings healing. We say, take that as the same exact thinking and we apply it to Jesus. You cannot truly be a servant of God if you're, the focus in your life is, God, what about me? I'm going to give you a wake-up wake call. It's not about you. The gospel is not about you. The gospel is not about me. The gospel is about Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What a wonderful person he is. What a savior he is. What a conqueror he is. And everything I am and everything I shall be, I will be in him and through him. That's what the word of God says, that we need to keep our eyes focused on him. The writer of Hebrew put, Hebrews puts it this way in 12th chapter, the second verse. Fix, we need to fix our eyes on Jesus. The author, I love what it says, that the author, he, he starts it. When it comes to our faith, it, it begins in him. That's, it has his origins in him. It was the author and perfecter of our faith. I love that part of it because it, it really ministers to me. Why? Because I, I, I wish I could tell you that I have faith for everything from the very beginning. You ever have faith for something with God, but when it, when it really got tough, Whatever it is that you're doing, your faith began to grow weak. Anybody? Raise your hand if that happened to you. You began to get like, you thought, and the funny part about it is you thought you, you, thought you were cool. Am I right? You're like, I got this. I got this. And then in the middle of it, it's like, you know, I, I, I saw these people, you see these videos, these TikTok or whatever, these crazy videos on, on, on a phone. So I'm afraid of heights. So I saw a video where they have these floating like pieces of wood and and the, and the question was would you do this and they're literally they have a harness but they have to put their 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 feet on, on these pieces of wood and and you could see like a precipice underneath it. i don't know god bless them <laughs> hallelujah i I'm, <laughs> i don't i don't have that gift man I'd be like, amen, I'll pray for you. But sometimes that's the way it is in our spiritual walk. God will put you in a situation where you're walking totally in faith. 
And, and you're in a situation, you make one false move, you're going to fall down. I mean, you know, he literally puts us in that place. Why? So we can keep, you know, you know, you know what I think the secret to, again, I'm not going to do it, but I think this, the only way I could possibly walk across those sticks is if I refuse to look below the sticks. If I'm just looking at the sticks, I might actually make it across. But the minute I look down, it's like, it's like Peter on the water. He looked down at the water and he realized what could possibly consume him. You know what? That's exactly what the enemy is trying to do. He wants you to take your eyes off of Jesus and look at every possible way that you can fail. You see, when we take our eyes off of Jesus... We now, are, we now have to look to ourselves for guidance. And when that happens, this is how, how the church of the last day ends up backslidden. They gradually turn to, to seducing spirits and ultimately to these false doctrines. And we have people that have cr crazy ideas. I was, you know, I, I looked at a situation, you know, Uh, where one person said they had, seriously, a, a, a believer or a supposed believer, right? To me, it got me, it, it upset me because, you know, she had come from this house. So I just, I just want to smack myself. I mean, like, where, where did I go wrong, right? So the statement was something to the effect of, you know, Christians need to get over abortion, man, and homosexuality. That's the law. Did you hear me? This is a supposedly saved person. First of, all, first of all, I need to, you know, I need to clarify something here. Okay, just because the Supreme Court says something is a law doesn't mean it stays the law. We have one decision called Plessy v. v. Ferguson, which established separate but equal. You know what? In this country, this country is a divided country. The Supreme Court authorized segregation. Are you hearing me? I love this country. I think it's the best country in the world. You know what? But I'm not going to cover the things that we did in the past. We did it. You know what? Let's learn from it. Yes. It wasn't until Brown, v, uh, uh, until Brown v. Board of Education that we finally said, you know what? Separate is not equal. But I love the way Thurgood Marshall ended up being a Supreme Court justice and argued countless cases before the Supreme Court. He was a genius. But it's interesting how he set it up. He set up Brown v. Board of Education by bringing another case before it. And you know what the case was? What, ha what had happened was that, uh, that African-American people looking to, be, to go to law school were not allowed to go to the same law schools as white folk. So what did he do? He brought it before the Supreme Court. And he presented the following argue, argument to, to all of those white justices up there. He says, he says to the justices, okay, so let me get this straight. African Americans not allowed to go to, a, to schools such as the ones you graduated from, Harvard, Yale, all these, all these schools. So what this court is saying, what you're saying is that the law school that you graduated from is as good that... that is the same as the law schools that they're being forced to go to. It's interesting. So now we got to their pride. Let me get this straight. So Harvard is the same as, as whatever this other law school is. That's what, you, that's what you're saying, right? It's the same, right? Is that what you're saying? Of course, the answer to that is no, it's not the same. And so they decided that case correctly and that, that, that fed... Brown v. Board of Education. But my point being is, just because the court says so doesn't mean it stays so. Right. Amen? Amen? Besides which, we answer to a higher court. Are you hearing me? We have a higher justice. His name is, is, is Jesus Christ. Come on, somebody. Give God some praise. We answer to a higher authority. Hallelujah. And so we need to understand that. But so many people, even today, are, are embracing this kind of insanity. People, Christian people today, give in to peer pressure and accept a false anti-biblical reality 
they use phrases like, it is well established. You ever heard that? They call it science. I believe in science. You believe in science? You know, if somebody ever tells you something is well established, you can rest assured that whatever the opposite is of whatever they're saying, that's what's really well established. Okay? They're, you know, it's the, the exact opposite of what they're saying is what is, is, what is well established. So the word of God speaks to that, that particular controlling mechanism. He says, these are hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared with a hot iron. And we allow ourselves to go down these ridiculous trails and embrace things which make no spiritual sense. How is it that we allow this to happen? How do we get sucked in? Because we abdicate our own responsibility to be honest with God, to be honest with ourselves, to be honest with others. And we try to live a spiritual life through other people. You cannot live your spiritual life through me. Are you hearing me? You cannot live your spiritual life through me. When you get to heaven, you're not going to be able to say, you know, hey, you know, I knew Pastor Mario. One of the scariest portions of the scriptures when Jesus says, depart from me, I never knew you. People that are deceived, man. We need to take responsibility for our own spiritual walk. You know what the word of God says? It says if we walk in the spirit, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's what we need to do. I, there's one passage, I, I, I wrote it here, which I think is really, it's, it's in uh, the word translation. I usually don't use it, but it, it kind of said this so beautifully that I thought it important to read it in this version. Listen to this kind of gives us a pattern of how we as believers need to walk. So, so here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing that you can do for him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit in without even, realize, without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. I'm speaking to you out of a deep gratitude for all that God has given me, and especially as I have responsibilities in relation to you. Living then as every one of you does in pure grace, it's important that you not misinterpret yourselves as people who are bringing this goodness to God. No, God brings it all to you. The only accurate way to understand ourselves is by what God is and by what he does for us, not by what we are and what we do for him. In this way, we are like the various parts of the human body. Each part gets its meaning from the body as a whole, not the other way around. The body we're talking about is, a, is Christ's body of chosen people. Each of us finds our meaning and function as a part of his body. But as a chopped off finger or cut off toe, we wouldn't amount to much, would we? So see, since we find ourselves fashioned into all these excellently formed and marvelously functioning parts, in Christ's body. Let's just go ahead and be what we were made to be. Without enviously or pridefully comparing ourselves with each other or trying to be something we aren't. If you preach, just preach God's message. Nothing else. If you help, just help. Don't take over. If you teach, stick to your teaching. Practice what you preach. If you give encouraging guidance, be careful that you don't get bossy. If you're put in charge, don't manipulate. If you're called to give aid to people in distress, keep your eyes open and be quick to respond. If you work with the disadvantaged, don't let yourself get irritated with them or depressed by them. 
Keep a smile on your face. Love from the center of who you are. Don't fake it. Run for dear life from evil. Hold on for dear life to good. Be good friends who love deeply. Practice playing second fiddle. Don't burn out. Keep yourselves fueled and aflame. Amen. Can I hear an amen? amen. Don't burn out. Keep yourselves fueled. And that is so critically important. Be alert servants of the master. Cheerfully expectant. Don't quit in hard times. Pray all the harder. Help needy Christians. Be inventive in hospitality. Bless your enemies. I love this, this one. Bless your enemies. No cursing under your breath. <laughs> I bless you. <laughs> Amen. Amen. No cursing under your breath. Laugh with your happy friends when they're happy. Share tears when they're down. Get along with each other. Don't be stuck up. Make friends with nobodies. Don't be the great somebody. Don't hit back. Discover beauty in everyone. If you got it in you, get along with everybody. Don't insist, insist on getting even. That's not for you to do. I'll do the judging, says God. I'll take care of it. Our scriptures tell us that if you see your enemy hungry, go buy that person lunch. Or if he's thirsty, get him a drink. Your generosity will surprise him with goodness. Don't let evil get the best of you. Get the best of evil by doing good. Amen? Amen. That, my friend, is what God wants us to be. That is how God wants us to live. And the only way that that happens if we keep our eyes set on Jesus we have to have a vision of God for ourselves. The pastor can't have a vision of God for you. But we have to look ahead and not look back. There is much more at stake in our normal everyday lives. And yet we loosely hang on to Christ. Letting go every time we're slightly tugged in the opposite direction. I can't tell you how many people have that kind of relationship with God. They'll tell me, Pastor, I'm, I'm hanging on. I'm, I'm holding on. But they're holding on so loosely to God. There's a song in Spanish from Jesus Adrián Romero. And... Uh, the name of the song is Quiero Vivir Pegado a Ti. You know, Quiero Vivir Pegado a Ti. I want to live stuck to you. I want to live stuck to you. That, 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 that's crazy. That's crazy. You know, people do some crazy dancing. Have you seen people dancing crazy? I'm like, get a room. I mean, seriously. What, what is that? Hopefully you're married, you know? It's like nuts, right? But from a spiritual perspective, I'm not a dancer, you know, I mean, God help me. But I have to dance for a wedding. I'm, I'm, I'm dying a million deaths, okay? It's the first time I do that in my life. But, uh, but when it comes to our lives with Christ, man, we need to overcome that hesitancy to be that close to him. You know, we need to be so close to him where he can, where we can sense his breath on us, right? That breath of God, right? That we, that we sense that we are safely in his arms. And by the way, if you're dancing with God, he gets to do the lead. Because the truth of the matter is that most of us are probably, yeah, we'll dance with Jesus, but then we'll kind of hog it all up and try to try to pull him in our direction and make him do what we want him to do. That's not the way it works. But there's a certain vulnerability. I have a, uh, 
I have a, a, a message. I haven't preached in a long time. Da- and, and the name of the, it's poor grammar, but the name of the message is dance with the one who brung you. Dance with the one who brung you. So many of us, man, God has, has done so much in our lives, man. Has he been good to you? And you know what we end up doing? We end up dancing with every Tom, Dick, and Harry. Anything that catches our attention. We call it ministry, too. You know? And you know what we forget to do? We forget to dance with the one who brung us, man. You know who brought us to this, you know who brought us to this party we call life? God did. And you know who we owe our dance to? We owe our dance to him. And he's the one that we need to be dancing with. And he's the one that we need to be caring about. And he's the one that we need to be looking at. Not anybody else. And let me tell you, man, there will be all kinds of people out there looking to catch your attention. Have the women women in here say amen? Amen? Anybody here was in the world? A little dancing and stuff like that in the world? Amen? Some of you? Am I, am I joking with this? There's some women out there who are looking for the attention of the men. True or not true? I mean, it's almost like they're making sure that if they walk into a room, all attention will, go, will, will come on them. You know, most women hate that. They're like, oh, you know, whatever. You think all kinds of crazy stuff in your head, but anyway, whatever. You know, but that's the devil. He wants to walk into our lives and wants to take control. You know why? Because it's, it's what the word of God says in, 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 our, in our key passage here today. No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. You know why? Because our heart's in the wrong place. What's it saying? He's saying, it's not saying that you walk back. He says that you look back. We're attracted from, we're attracted, we're allowing ourselves to be attracted by the things that had us bound. You know why? Most of the time, because our faith fails. And we start thinking about how big the onions were in Egypt, which, which to me is kind of weird. You know, I'm a, I love onions and garlic like more than the next guy, man. I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a big lover. I, I love that stuff. But how big does an onion have to be for you to want to be a slave again? I don't know what they had in Egypt, man. But it couldn't have been that good. But it goes to show you how the enemy will deceive us into thinking that the junk we used to live on before is good enough for us now. You know what? The devil is a liar. Hallelujah. God set you free for a purpose so that you can live free. So that you can stay free. Hallelujah. So that you could be fit to serve in the kingdom of God. Why? Because our heart is in the right place. And I'm going to ask you today, where is your heart? Where is your focus? What are you looking at? What is it that's drawing your attention? During this time, man, during this whole, you know, I think people have just, you know, you're, you're stuck at home and, 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 you know, thinking dumb thoughts. Some of us, our minds have gone to places they should never have gone. Can I hear an amen? Some of us have, inter- have, have um, entertained fear at levels we could, we could never think that we would ever be there. We've allowed ourselves to be influenced. You know, and we've internalized this stuff. Word of God says, God has not given you a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. That God who saved you, he will keep you. I'm standing here as a proof positive that God is a keeping God. But even me, you know, at a moment there, there was a moment, a brief moment, as it were, where I said, you know, you know, if it's time, it's time, Lord, I'll go with you. But my trust is in you. You know what God did? 
God made it so I got a bunch of calls from people at my worst time needing prayer and intercession because they lost loved ones or, you know, people crying. I'm hearing in the background. They had no idea I was sick and I wasn't about to tell them. What I did was that I prayed. And as I called upon heaven, faith began to swell up inside of me. Hallelujah. As I looked to Jesus, you know, when you look to Jesus, he so overwhelms you that you can't think of anything else. You can't think of anything else. You forget your trials. You forget your sickness, man. You forget anything. Why? Because you're looking at the person that you love. And you may not have a tomorrow, but today, you got Jesus. And you could look to him. And he looks back to you. And he says, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. He's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. He satisfies in ways that no human being could ever satisfy. The key is that we keep our eyes on him. Let's bow our heads, every head bowed, every eye.